Many stories, ghost stories, only ghost stories. I never cared to try any other kind. And the question arises, do I believe in ghosts? Well, I'm prepared to consider evidence and accept it if I'm satisfied. Here in my study, there's a desk full of notes, random jottings which never quite materialize, half-formed ideas that nudge the mind from time to time, they affect me like a tap on the shoulder, a whisper in the ear. Consider, for example, the curious business of the travelling companion. Wait, let me open the drawer. You shall judge for yourself. Ah, here we are. I've been on a bicycling tour. I was on my way to meet Anthony Guthrie in Troyes. Bicycling down one of those long French roads, I had the misfortune to hit a stone and fall quite heavily, throwing the machine against a tree. While attempting to repair the damage, I heard a voice calling, a young English voice. I say, I say, excuse me, are you all right? Are you all right? I saw you take a bit of a tumble. Ah, Kyle. Now, how did you guess I was English? I heard you say something that sounded awful like, uh, <laughs> damn. <laughs> ah. <clears throat> uh, I suppose it's too much to hope you're a trained mechanic. Good Lord, no. I'm a student. Ah, uh, my name is James, and uh, if you could direct me to the nearest hotel, is there something within walking or, or rather wheeling distance? La Perrière. I'm staying there myself, as a matter of fact. I'm Robert Stafford. I really am very pleased to see you, Mr. Stafford. <laughs> uh, can you uh, straighten that wheel a little? I think so. Uh, um... Yes, if I just... That's better. Capital. On holiday? It's the long back, sir. I generally go abroad. Of course. Which brings me to the essential question. Where are we? Near Trois, sir. The hotel's at Marcelle La Haire, in the Grand Place. It's not too bad. I've been there for ten days. Oh, really? An interesting town, then. No. I wouldn't call it... No. No, oh, look. There's a ferrier behind the trees. We came to an open square, and he pointed to a three-gabled house. <laughs> the manager, a thin fellow with a, a nasty habit of sucking his front teeth, said, Chambre sans bain, monsieur. <laughs> For all the world, as if he thought anyone who arrived on a bicycle, and a broken bicycle at that, couldn't possibly afford a bath. I took the register away from him. What is the date, Mr. Stafford? August the 4th, sir. 4th of August, 1907. So there you are. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. My dear man, those are my... Oh, oh right. I see your difficulty. M. R. James, hmm? not Mr. James. M. R. Montague Rhodes, if you care for the information. Uh, I say, please forgive me, but are you Dr. James? Yes, I am. Don't you write magazine stories, ghost stories? No. If anything I have written in that line has given you pleasure, Mr. Stafford, I'm glad. Do you mind if we sit down? Why not? I think the porter is taking my bag up, and I should be glad of a rest. It's very good of you, sir. Ah. Uh, shall we have some coffee? Yes, please. Garçon, oui, monsieur. Deux cafés, s'il vous plaît. Deux cafés. Deux cafés. Now, you have my attention, Mr. Stafford. I was going to Troyes by train. I got into a carriage. There was nobody else there except this old French woman with a moustache. <laughs> well, I wanted to read, and I found I'd forgotten to buy any papers. I had nothing except a second-hand novel I picked up in Paris on the Reef Ghost. A leather-bound volume called Madame de Lichtenstein. Mm -hmm. Merci, bien. Uh, do go on, Mr. Stafford. Pretty dreary stuff, as a matter of fact. Until I came to a bit about Madame Blanche Angers, a formidable character with black hair parted down the centre, 
a moustache, and gold tooth which flashed whenever she opened her mouth. Yeah. But she lived in Marseille, yeah. and the chapter described how her son, Maurice, vanished one night in October and was never seen again. Mm. Madame Angier became distracted. She adored the boy. She searched week after week. But at this point, our train stopped with a jerk, and the old lady opposite me rose to get her baggage together. I glanced up and found myself staring at black hair parted in the middle, a moustache, and as she lifted the case down, a luggage label bearing the words, Madame Blanche Angier, Marseille, La Hair, France. <laughs> Do be careful with that cup. It gave me a shock. I thought I must have fallen asleep. I must have driven. Well, I couldn't resist it. Madame, I said, where are we? And as she answered, Trois, I caught the flash of a gold tooth. Curious. What do you make of it, sir? My dear fellow, what is there to make of it? A traveling companion who is apparently described in your book. Dr. James, this is 1907. The book was printed in 1783. Have you reread the passage? Have you checked? I mean, that's the obvious thing to do, isn't it? Oh, don't you think I haven't tried? But the book runs to 900 pages in very fine print. And meanwhile, you are kicking your heels in Marseille la You're not trying to find this mysterious Madame Angier. I feel a sort of compulsion. I feel, uh, please don't mind. As if I'm under some kind of obligation. Do you know what I mean? No. It's as if I'd made a promise to someone and can't remember who it was or what I promised to do. Mr. Stafford. Yes? Uh, you might care to show me that book before you go. I have some knowledge of these matters. It could be valuable. So I don't want to raise your hope. And so we parted. My bedroom looked out across the square. It seemed clean enough, and I couldn't actually complain about the bed. But the moment I lay down that night, one quite horrid defect soon made itself apparent. <sighs> How can anybody hope to sleep? Good gracious. <sighs> Who's there? Stafford. <sighs> Do you know the time? What's the matter? I'm sorry. I realize I should have it, but there's nobody else, you see. And it's getting worse. My dear boy, are you ill? Oh, please don't laugh. I think there's somebody outside my window. Trying to break in? We must call the manager at once. Could you come with me quickly? My room's just on the corner. If you might at least give me time to put on my dress. Well, I'm only asking you to look. I, I expect his imagination to get the light. If, if you can't see it, well, I must be dreaming. And if I'm dreaming, I can always wake up. I do I? promise you. You are wide awake and standing on my dressing gown cord. <clears throat> now, what is this? I've been reading that book, doing as you suggested, trying once again to find the page. I sat up in bed for hours, the blankets pulled tight across my chest. No, I give you my word, I wasn't tired. I wasn't tired in the least. Mm -hmm. I had the strangest sensation of, of being watched. I could hear the wind scratching around the house. The maid had left a gap in the curtains. I got up to close them. Yes. There was a hand pressed against the glass. But as I got closer, the hand dissolved. And when I stared out, there seemed to be a foremost blur, something that heaved and unbillowed on the balcony. Oh, that's just it, you see. There are no balconies on my side of the hotel. It, it's one of the cheap rooms. Oh, God, we can't have this. A uh, night mist, I imagine. In August? We're here. Look. What? Let me see. Nothing. A tree tapping against the sill. Good heavens, what a wind. And it's strangely cold in here. Do get back into bed. You have no slippers on. Forgive me, Doctor. Oh, I say, what an awful thing to do. I'm so sorry. Only, it really did seem terribly real. You're exhausted. You've read too much and had a nightmare. Now, don't worry on my account. Good night, Mr. Stafford. I left him there and managed to get some sleep myself in spite of the relentless booming of that wretched town hall clock. The morning opened bright and sunny. Thank you, thank you. Uh, no, yeah. Hello. I had to come over and, uh, well, apologize. Well, it doesn't matter in the least. Uh, have you had breakfast? Not yet. I slept rather late. I'm not surprised. Oh, do sit down. Thank you. Uh, coffee, I suppose, please. 
Gaston. Oui, monsieur. Encore deux cafés. Deux cafés. Mr. Stafford. Good Lord. Now, don't tell me your apparition has reappeared. Why are you staring? Well, there's a girl across the square. Just coming out of the bakery. Look. Ah. Now, that is a much healthier preoccupation. Oh, she's pretty. Oh, how can you be so, so blasted, matter of fact? She is the most beautiful girl I've ever seen. Who is she? Well, now, Mr. Stafford, am I likely to know? I arrived with you, remember, late last night. Do be reasonable. Somebody must know. Gasson? Gasson? Please, ask him. I don't trust my French. All right. Monsieur, votre café. Uh, Excusez-moi. Uh, Connaissez-vous cette jeune fille? Uh, S'il vous plaît, monsieur. Cette jeune fille, là. Uh, oui, monsieur. Oui, oh, does. Ask him what he's called. Un uh, moment. Uh, uh, comment s'appelle Angers? <laughs> Madame Maurice Angers. Excusez-moi. Oui, monsieur. Angers? The name is fairly common, I expect. Maurice Angers? He was, in was the... mentioned in your book, or you think he was, but as you can't find the page, we are no further on. It's destiny. It must be. I was brought here for a purpose. But really, the whole idea of picking up a strange idea. And another thing, you know, he said Madame Angers, which means she is married. I don't care. This is high summer, Mr. Stafford. Not merry, merry springtime. Oh, do be sensible. Oh, Lord. Am I making the most ghastly act of myself? Not a bit, a bit. Jeunesse d'Ore. But I will pretend I'm not envious. Et in Arcadia ego. I, too, have lived in Arcadia. <sighs> but I do wish you'd get on a bus. Yes, that's all now, thank you. But it wasn't, of course. It wasn't the end of it by any means. For later that night... I should go mad. Oh, blast the man who invented clockwork. What am I going to do? I can't possibly sleep. Oh, perhaps a little fresh air. Oh, now what's happened? Oh, boots. Oh, I should have put those outside the door. And there's a strange sight when you consider it. A long corridor and rows of shoes waiting patiently for the morning. If some pint piper were to come along and whistle up shoes instead of rats. Ah! What in heaven's name? Dave! Oh, thank God! At the window again! It's burst! It's there Mr. again! Stafford! Fingers! Oh, and at the glass! Yeah. It's trying to get in! Do please calm yourself! If you've had a nightmare... I am not dreaming! I heard a noise and, oh, God, God, there are two of them now! Now, uh, lean against the wall. People are coming. Now, tell me quietly what it is you see. The form of a woman. It was the other thing, the thing beside her. Some animal, you mean? She held, held something by the hand. And it was so shaky. It smelled abominable. And it had no face. It's a gray Slimy blood, James. James, it was dripping wet. Oh, <laughs> there followed, as you can imagine, considerable uproar. I have no other recollection of that night, except, yes, I did examine the window in Stafford's room. The curtain felt damp, and there was a small pool of water on the floor. The next day, quite determined to distract my young friend, I suggested a walk. Something had to be done to divert his mind from these horrid events. He looked pale, and I thought he meant to refuse. But then he said, I say, would you mind awfully? Could we go to the villa? It's only half a mile down the road, and if we hang around a bit... We might run into Madame Angier. Incidentally, I spoke to the hotel manager. She is a widow. Good Lord, what a perfectly astounding piece of luck. Not for the husband. No. I suppose not. Sorry. Did he say anything else? 
Yes, he asked rather pointedly when we intended to leave. About Madame Angers. Local gossip. Tell me. Oh, some ancient scandal. Apparently, Monsieur Angers. Maurice Angers. Yes. He disappeared in rather odd circumstances three years ago. Go on. Well, apparently, he walked out of the back door one October night after dinner. And has never been seen since. That is the rumor. Good heavens, that's the story I read in my book. Oh, Lord, I wish I could find that passage again. You still can't? No, not yet. Oh, dear me, what a pity. You think I've invented the whole thing, don't you? You certainly haven't invented Madame Orchier. She lives with her family half a mile outside the town. And she's a widow. You said the river flows hard by their garden. It was in flood at the time, and Maurice Angers is popularly believed to have drowned. Poor man. But I cannot pretend the news depressed him. On the contrary, as we strolled along the road, surrounded by poplars like so many exclamation marks, he began to whistle. At least my little ploy had succeeded. He had entirely forgotten the alarms of the night before. Awfully joy country, don't you think? That must be the river. It's quiet enough at the moment. And there's the house. I say, I've had a terrific idea. Would it be awful cheap to ask the way? I beg your pardon. We were a couple of Englishmen. I mean... We could quite easily have got lost. We are not lost, Mr. Stafford. The town lies... I know. But if we had lost the way, it would be the most natural thing in the world to go up to the door and knock and ask, and then perhaps Venus herself would answer. Look here. Do you mind if I have a shot? It's up to you, Mr. Stafford. Do as you please. He ran up the steps and grabbed the bell, which echoed in the distance with a dismal appeal. The house appeared large, set in sizable grounds. The family had been wealthy, I imagine. It struck me the place might be of some archaeological interest. Busy with this idea, I hadn't seen the door open. And then I heard Stafford gasp. Oh. I turned, and there she stood in the doorway, black hair parted in the middle, a small moustache disfiguring the upper lip. Narrow eyes intent on my companion. He said something, and it must have been in English. He tried to back away, but as I watched, the madame grinned, I cannot call it a smile, and placing a distorted claw on his shoulder, drew him inside. I followed, and tried to pretend I hadn't noticed the flash of a gold tooth. Je vais chercher quelqu'un qui parle anglais. Did you see? Clearly, she was on the train with me. And I swear, now listen, I swear, I swear she was described in my book. Oh, do be sensible. Excuse me, mon monsieur, I can help you. The silence that followed became a little embarrassing. Not that I blame my companion, for the girl approaching down the corridor possessed a really startling beauty. Blonde hair piled high, a cool elegance, which somehow combined with the sensual promise of a Rubens. I am informed that you have lost yourself. <clears throat> we were out for a walk, madame, and have somehow missed the route. I see. And where are you trying to go? Oh, uh, oh, yes. Oh, this is marvelous. To find you. I mean, to um, find that you can speak English. And so well, too. I think you laugh at me. Oh, no. Oh, never. Pardon. We do not see many strangers here. I have very little chance to speak. Oh, but your English is perfect. I mean, doesn't she speak perfect English, Dr. James? Why, yes, indeed. Merci bien. I can at least say welcome. Oh, excuse-moi. I am so pleased to see you. Really? Oh, I say, that is wonderful. We don't want to intrude. We mustn't uh, make a nuisance of ourselves. I know. I have longed for company. To me. You're all alone in this great big house. Oh, I had friends, but always they go away. Uh, I think we saw your mother, madame. No, 
You have seen my husband, mother. She does not speak English, so she cannot talk with you. But you can. I make a small attempt. With pleasure. Oh. Uh, uh, perhaps you have a, a map of the district. Uh, we should be very grateful. Uh, a map? In cart. Ah, yes. You must discover your way. And leave. Stupid of us to get lost. It's a uh, rather a lonely part of the world, you see. I find it so. Only, if you could help us, then... Wait, wait for me. I shall try. I say, that's really quick of you. What a capital idea. We can spend hours trying to read a map. Not if we hope to have any luncheons. Look out. The old girl's coming back. Hello. Monsieur de Ville. Uh, <laughs> what? She's asking what you want. Oh, you uh, better tell her I decline to take any further part in the charade. Oh, uh, yes. Um, un carte, s'il vous plaît. Un carte? <laughs> Pourquoi? I beg your pardon? What do you want it for? Ah, uh, pour chercher, um, uh, to find our way. Uh, Oh, Lord, I do wish you wouldn't cook a finger like that. Monsieur. Monsieur. Hmm? Je vous attendez. Dr. James? What an extraordinary thing. I thought she said she'd been waiting for us. And clearly, I'd misunderstood the French. Voyez-vous un aperitif, no? What's she on about now? Oh, do smile. That hmm? at least is splendidly plain. She's just offered you a drink. Oh, Thank you. Uh, merci. That's very kind. Thank you. Entrez. 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 I really felt we had misjudged Madame Blanche, as she was called. I could have wished she hadn't grinned so frequently, revealing blackened teeth around the flash of gold. Uh, but she had the most amiable intentions. She urged us to take little glasses of cognac. She produced a map, and she positively encouraged Venus, uh, whose Christian name, by the way, was Louise, uh, to help Stafford in his search for um, whatever it was he decided we had lost. This is awfully jolly. Oh, I say. What very good brandy. Your help, madame. Good fortune, monsieur. To us all. Oh, look, we can't go on being so formal. I'm Robert Stafford. Robert. Oh, and you? What's your name? Louise Angier. Madame Maurice Angier. Quel garçon, non? Maurice was your husband. He's dead. We don't talk of him. We drink to happiness. To happiness. Which is so difficult to find. Is it? For some, I think. Dr. James, could you talk to the old lady? I'd be frightfully blind. Oh, dear me. Is that good manners, do you think? Well, oh, your French is better than mine. Yes, I have no answer to that. Oh, what a pity. But in half an hour, I shall leave, Mr. Stafford. You have been warned. Uh, uh, Madame, uh, vous êtes trop aimable. <coughs> Merci beaucoup de nous avoir reçu. Oh, look here. It's such a warm day, and I'd love to see your garden. Shall we go out? Right? No. No, please. I do not wish it. No, no, no. no. All right. Excuse me. I have a small coat. I, I must be careful. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, do forgive me. I, I didn't realize. I saw him break up a chair and arrange a cushion at her back. His hand touched the golden head very briefly. I moved away, partly to distract Madame Blanche. I made some idle remark about the villa the age of the outbuildings. To my surprise, and without a moment's hesitation, she opened the window and drew me out onto the terrace. I turned to help her down the step. I caught the most extraordinary expression on her face. If it hadn't been so unlikely, I could have sworn Madame had seen through our pretense and was delighted at the outcome. 
I must make some inquiries at the town hall. Madame Blanche showed me an ancient well, half hidden in bushes at the far end of a dead vineyard. Immensely deep, I dropped a pebble down. Stone carving on the base, and an inscription in Latin, which I copied. Do you think we could get some more bread? <laughs> well done. I beg your pardon? At least it hasn't spoiled your appetite. What has the fatal charm of Madame Louise? Oh, Doctor. You cannot deny that she is the most wonderful girl in the world. Madame Louise. And she's had such a tragic life, losing her husband and then being persecuted by that horrible old woman. Madame Louise. When I think of what Louise has suffered, I could kill that creature. Oh, come now. You're falling in love, as I understand it. Please don't complicate matters by planning a murder. She needs my help. She wants to get out of France, and I have got to see her again. That might present some difficulty. You could hardly get lost twice in one day. Can you keep a secret? No, and I absolutely decline to be told one. I've arranged to meet her. Tonight, my dear fellow. No doubt you can handle your own affairs. She made an appointment. And that's where you come in. Mr. Stafford, I don't come into it. I refuse to come into it. She asked me to wait at the side window tonight. That sweet girl has been long to escape. She's almost a prisoner. Apparently the neighbors talk, and there's been a lot of foul gossip since Angers died. He is dead, I suppose. Drowned, isn't he? Nobody has ever been found, Mr. Stafford. And so, in law, no proof. No, he's dead, all right. Right. According to Louise, his mother searched for over two years. Poor woman, if you like. Quite honestly, I think Madame Blanche is mad. Uh, a little cheese, Stafford, or... Uh... Uh, one of those magnificent peaches. No, nothing for me, thank you. In there, she will play. Yeah. Well, you must have felt it, Doctor. It, it, it hung around her like, a, like an actual smell. This is subjective reasoning. Hmm? You believe Madame stands between you and the beautiful Louise. I know she does. Yeah, not a lot of passion, Monsieur. And yet, I got quite the opposite impression. Oh, not disagreeable. What is it? There is a worm inside this peach stone. Quite a large, green worm. Now, that has destroyed my appetite tonight. I wish you'd help me. I beg your pardon? Garçon, garçon. Monsieur. Oh, le vaisseau. C'est armangeable. Oh, monsieur, je l'exprime. Unless you have other plans for evening, of course. But honestly, it wouldn't take long. No. If you could just come with me to the door. So that if Madame Blanche pops out, there are two of us, and we could say we were, um, to taking an evening stroll in somebody else's garden. Well, calling to pay our respects, then. Late at night, Mr. Stafford. Mr. Stafford. No. Oh, I'm sorry. It was rather cheeky, I suppose. Forget it. Yes, well, that is out of the question. I shan't sleep a wink, knowing you're wandering about a strange French villa, unliable to be arrested or set upon by fierce dogs. I can certainly keep fierce dogs. Uh, I can't persuade you to give up the whole idea, I suppose. I gave my word to Louise. Ah, oh, well, in that case, I had better accompany you. If only to see what sort of mischief you tumble into. Thank you. Garçon, l'addition, s'il vous plaît. The building lay well back from the gate. By day, I thought it pretty ordinary. At night, it looked rather disturbing. There were no lights in the windows, which struck me as curious. A blank wall rising high above the trees. And all around us, those wretched bushes sprawled. And far away, a small wind cracked the dying vines. Stafford lost his footing twice, and the second fall made him clutch at me nearly bringing both of us down. Oh, my dear fellow, be careful. I'm awfully sorry. I must warn you, the ground is very uneven, and somewhere we shall come upon a well. It stopped a bit. I can't see the French windows, can you? No. And Louise told me to wait by the French window. I am beginning to doubt the wisdom of this whole adventure. We should have brought a torch. Not unless you want to be arrested as a burglar. A fate which is really becoming more likely at every step. Oh, Lord. Can you remember the position of the room? And where did we have the drinks with? I have no idea. It's so difficult to tell with all the blasted shutters closed. Uh, that one? No, we faced a long path. That one? Mr. Stafford, this is not sensible. 
What kind of woman would expect you to keep a rendezvous in the dark outside a strange house? Hmm? The terrace. Of course, you walked out with Madame Blanche onto a flat terrace, and there it is. Capital. What next? I can't see anybody. I am. She told me to whistle. Oh, dear me. We had to have a signal. We didn't want to wake the whole household. Oh, no, quite. Whistle away, then. For it is growing distinctly cold. Look, this sounds horribly ungrateful, but would you... Do you mind, uh... Could you wait somewhere else? Why? I don't want to frighten Louise. She isn't expecting to. I thought the whole point of my being here was to add some semblance of decency to this escapade. I'm sorry. If I could just have a word with her first. All right. No, it is not all right at all. Oh, well. But I withdrew to a spot beyond the terrace. It had been raining and a curious damp smell rose from the ground. I kept my eye on young Stafford. But to be honest, the entire adventure now struck me as full of undesirable possibilities. After a while, I heard him whistle. Nothing happened. A bird, woken from sleep, flapped suddenly among the bushes and then lay still. It was getting very cold indeed. He stopped whistling. Hoping, I suppose, for some answer. A chink of light, footsteps, a whisper breaking the air. Nothing happened. It grew a little tedious. I had an unpleasant suspicion we were making ourselves ridiculous. What if a servant came out? Or Madame Blanche, with her grim face peering round the door. What reasonable or civilized explanation could we possibly give? Oh, what's that? Only a branch. I trod on a piece of rotten wood. I heard indeed. But what prompted the cry was something quite other. My eye had caught a fleeting impression of a face pressed to the glass, grinning down at us. When I looked squarely at the house, there was no such thing. Only a row of dark windows shuttered against the night. Stafford! Go back! This cannot go on. Do be sensible. Madame Louise has changed her mind. She is not going to appear. I really must get back to my bed. Wait, Mr. Stafford, you are hurting my arm. Can you hear it? Good heavens. Louise. Where is she? Oh, that is very curious. Louise. Louise. I fail to understand it. No one has come out of the house. She's been waiting for me all this time. Out of doors. Oh, come, the thing has just not reached the point. Why should a young girl be wandering about in the garden when she has told you to meet her at the window? There is some mistake. Listen. Yes, I can hear it too. Louise. Louise. Keep your voice down. You will wake Madame Blanche. I can see her. I can't. Look. A glimmer of white over there. What's the thing you... Is that a figure? It's more like mist drifting away. Oh, you've got bad eyesight. It's Louise. It must be. Oh, very well. Off you go, then. I will wait for you on the terrace. But he had already gone. Running down the path with a long, swift leap of yours. I turned back. The wind seemed to be rising. Leaves scuttled past my feet. And then... Oh, no! To my astonishment, the French windows split open and out came Madame Louise. She had wrapped herself in some dark cloak... But the wind caught strands of her blonde hair and hugged them loose. Beyond question, it was Madame Louise. So who was it who had walked before in the billiard and whistled in the night? I swung round. I could just see Stafford. He reached the old well and stopped. No doubt puzzled. Now he went beyond the well, crisscrossing the ground like some anxious dog. It occurred to me I must speak to Madame Louise. I must explain this unaccountable mistake. But long before I could reach her, Stafford began to whistle. 
The girl hurt him too. She had been peering into the darkness, puzzled. At the sound, she drew her cloak tight to the neck and began to run. The wind lifted her skirts as she went. The hood fell back and blonde hair tumbled in the gale. I watched her go and suddenly became aware of noises. The wind, perhaps? But this was not the wind. This was a strange, dry, pattering sound. As if innumerable mice were running over dead leaves. It was an accident. The French officials declared themselves quite satisfied on that point. Madame Louise had tripped while running to meet her lover. An explanation very acceptable to the French. Madame Louise had pitched head forward and fallen into the gaping mouth of the well. The lover was, understandably, in a state of collapse, and the good Madame Blanche had been in bed at the time. Some attempt was made to recover the body and ran up against unexpected difficulties. The well shaft proved abnormally deep. And halfway down, the workmen were driven back by a kind of poisonous gas. They can't. It's too horrible. They can't just leave her down there. My dear Stafford, they may have to. I'm so very sorry. I shall never forgive myself. Oh, come. If I'd only waited by the house. You gave your evidence very clearly, and they said you were not to blame. Dr. James. You try and believe me. I can still hear her screaming. Go back to England. There is nothing I can do. Quite. This place will haunt me for the rest of my life. My dear friend. <laughs> You have my sympathy, but you exaggerate. I was so happy that evening. I felt like a man possessed. And when I saw Louise running towards no, me... No, I... no, forget. By the way, I have your book, and as you will be returning... Oh, home, God, no, no, I don't want that. As you prefer. I did mean to mention one curious thing. I've read the book from cover to cover. There is no passage describing Madame Angier. What? You must have imagined it. No. I do assure you, the paragraph quite simply isn't there. But it is. It was. The whole business started with that book. I sat in a railway carriage reading, and I felt, I felt the most extraordinary sensation. Of what, friend? The, the dominant evil. Forgive me, I am not doubting your word. I can only speak as I find, Mr. Stafford. But this is ridiculous. The old lady sat opposite me, and I read the book, and the book described the old lady. But if I hadn't, I should never have followed her. I should never have come to the villa. I should never have met the lady. Uh, here, il y a certain qui vous demande, uh, certain monsieur Gatley. Monte. And stay, my dear fellow. I, I've been here a couple of hours. How are you, my dear fellow? <laughs> I traveled up with Ramsey. We thought of pushing on straight away, if that suits you. Uh, may I introduce uh, Mr. Robert Stafford? Mr. Anthony Gutter. How do you do? Uh, Monty, what is this I hear about an accident to your bicycle? Good mended. Oh, thank goodness. I had horrid visions of sitting in the sun while you wrestled with a spanner. <laughs> it's such a perfect day. We rather wanted to ride on down to Soissons, if you're agreeable. Excuse me, gentlemen. I have to pay my bill. Yes, goodbye. Goodbye. Uh, now, can your hotel do us a pack much? Hmm? Uh, I'm sorry. I was thinking of something else. Anthony, do you believe in auto-suggestion? No. Look, we shall need three packed lunches and a couple of bottles of wine and in the lunch. I left that morning with my friends. I never heard of Mr. Stafford again. A faint doubt troubled my memory. Can such things be? Where did I put my spectacles? Ah, yes. That's better. Nothing remains of the affair except a scrap of paper on which I seem to have scribbled a few words in Latin. Here we are. Deque manet ultor. It was, as I remember, scratched on the base of the well. Deque manet ultor. There is an avenger for you, too. Whether Madame Angers exercised 
some kind of hypnotic pressure on a young and pliable brain, whether she drew Stafford after her, whether indeed it was Madame Archer who appeared outside his bedroom window, I simply don't know. We are left with the interdependence of all things. It is certain that if he had not been in the garden by the well, Madame Louise would not have fallen to her death. Fallen? Yes, but there's another thing. My eyesight is not good. No doubt night mist and distance deceived me, because for one second I thought Stafford dragged her down, which is clearly impossible, and I wouldn't worry the police or distress him with such manifest absurdity. He loved Louise Auger, beyond question, and unless he had been out of his mind, he... I sometimes wondered, when you are out of your mind, can someone else be in it? The whole story came back to me last week when by accident I picked up a French newspaper in my club. A tiny paragraph on the second page reported that workmen had at last succeeded in getting down the shaft at Marseille and had recovered not one body, but two. Maurice Angier lay dead at the bottom also. Now, what do you make of that, hmm? That was A Whisper in the Ear by Sheila Hodgson, based on an idea by M. R. James. With David March as James, Steve Hodgson as Stafford, Griselda Harvey as Madame Blanche Angier, and Mandy Cuthbert as Madame Louise Angier. The hotel manager and Anstey Guthrie were played by Geoffrey Siegel, and the waiter by Douglas Blackwell. The play was